Hello everyone, my name is Spencer Walsh. Welcome to today's show. We have a good one for you as always on the show today. How to prepare for the election and it could be a long one. We'll give you the the full details on when the results are expected and why they may take a little bit extra in terms of time. Also, elementary schools have been evacuated in Springfield, Ohio, following several bomb threats explicitly targeting the Haitian population there as we continue to see this rolling effect of the really awful stuff that Trump and Vance have been pushing in the debate. Boeing factory workers are beginning a strike action for the really first time in a long time. We'll give you the full details on that. Um, We are also taking a look at an interview with the Uncommitted founder explaining the movement's strategy and a report from Dropside News talking to one of the most important journalists from the genocide in Gaza, Anas al-Sharif of Al Jazeera, taking a look at what he had to say and what it is like really there to be on the ground reporting. But I do think it is important to get into our, you know, news of the day. Some very important election news coming up. But I do want to get let you know about the Supporters Club option. You have option for ad-free episodes. Every episode ad-free. You know, I put a lot of ads on this for a reason. So you can go and subscribe to the Supporters Club because it's a lot better. And we're doing also some bonus episodes there as well. It's going to be a lot of fun. So uh, go check it out. Five or four dollars a month, really. Uh, it is now on the link in the description. It's going to be absolutely a very fun time, and I hope if Newsflash needs somebody to you, they consider up uh, signing up and doing it. So, let's start with this: uh, these election night party preparation article here in the New York Times. Those of election night parties may want to book a room for more than just one night. For the second straight presidential election, it is becoming increasingly likely there will be no clear and immediate winner on election night, and that early returns could give a false impression of who will ultimately prevail. So it's, it seems very likely that we'll have some sort of stop the steal moment given just how close everything is. The polls could not be tighter. And of course, we'll see how things look after the debate. But, you know, it is really surprising. It is like, you know, you, you are one point either direction it completely shifts the direction of the, of the race, taking it from, you know, a landslide. You know, that is how big it could be in terms of so many states just on the knife's edge and states that people didn't think would be brought into play, for example, like North Carolina, are being brought into play. Um, you know, Kamala's coalition seemed to be a bit different than Biden's coalition. But the reason for this is, of course, that large swaths of Americans have changed their voting habits in recent years, relying increasingly on mail-in ballots, which take more time to count than those cast in person on Election Day. States with prolonged vote counting processes, such as Arizona, have become suddenly competitive. And the race between Vice President Kamala Harris and former President Donald J. Trump appears extremely close. If a winner is not declared on election night, it will not necessarily point to a failure in the process. More likely, it will be a result of intense security measures required for counting mail-in ballots. And this is where I think it really does require, you know, and you can't expect, you know, responsible rhetoric on this from people in the Trump campaign, given what happened last time. And I think it it makes a lot of sense to start thinking about and preparing for a really similar situation to 2020, because, you know, it's going to be a very close, it's going to be very competitive. Um, You know, I, for example, I know I'm going to be voting in mail-in ballots this year just because of where I am. And it's, it's just going to be a part of the American election system, and I think it really needs to start being prepared for it now, and the kind of liberal side, I guess, can't really, you know, should be pushing this as much as possible because you can't really expect it from the conservative side. Or I guess, you know, that could just cause the conservative side to become more pissed off, but I think that a lot of people, bottom line is, a lot of people trust the process, but I think it cannot hurt to prepare people for what is, you know, inevitably going to happen if we look at the, the results and the, and, and the way things currently stand, um, because 
you know, it, it's important that that faith holds. Because I think, very rightly so, a lot of people thought that the Stop the Steelers were ridiculous. A lot of people, you know, had no time for even the people that, you know, like to be a little bit cute with it, saying, oh, you know, there's some real problems with the election system that we need to really think about here. You know, it's just like, huh, come on. Like, that's that's not something that anybody should be taking seriously because it's just, it's, it's really bad faith. And it's like, yeah, there are mail-in votes. It's That's how the system works. So people can vote more easily. And that is a system that we should be fighting to create. So I think, yeah, very, very important that the the country in some way, shape, or form is prepared for the, you know, articles like the New York Times and us covering this. They're going to be, you know, small but critical steps in that to prepare people for the fact that it is going to take a long time. It's not going to be the most reassuring uh, situation here, to say the least. Um, I kept keep objecting to the term delays, says Al Schmidt, Republican Secretary of State of Pennsylvania. The ballots, he said, would be counted as expeditiously as possible, and counting votes takes time. And it is, again, a much, much better system where we can actually have these votes coming in and have more people with the opportunity to vote if they're in different places and they can't make it to the their specific polling place based on their registered residence at polling day. You know, I think that is a very, very good thing. It's a very, very important thing for the completion of our democracy that th- all those votes are eventually counted. But I, and, and I and I do think for you know a lot of the kind of concerned liberals out there, if you look at the polls, if you look at the response from the country, if you look at the response from the country's institutions, this stuff was pretty much cast out of hand. It was, it was it's it's very politically unpopular for Trump to even to bring up now. So I think that is you know that is very very telling uh, in terms of how we sh- in terms of what we should be expecting from the public. But, you know, it's not going to be – it's not guaranteed, for example, that it always stays that way. So it does require a lot of vigilance um, on that front. So, yeah, of course, you know, counting mail, it's, mail ballots just takes more time because there are more steps involved. It's security. It's, a, it's more transportation. So it is definitely something that is going to be monitored very closely, an important thing to know going into this election. Um, let's do a quick look at the polls post the debate. Trump has taken a small dip. It's now 49, 46 in the national average, a pretty good Ipsos poll has uh, her up five nationally, but in terms of the latest polls, let's go all key state polls and select pollsters. Let's filter out. Let's get the good stuff here. We have Trump up three in Georgia. This is before all this stuff here is uh, before the debate, and Kamala Harris up three in North Carolina, um, and up six in Wisconsin. Um, Marquette has her up four in Wisconsin. So pretty much, the states where he seems to be doing the best right now are Georgia and Arizona. It's and it's uh, it's really weird because I have a hard time imagining her doing well in North Carolina but poorly in Georgia and in Arizona. So it's it's a very strange system that uh you know seems to be <laughs> exactly um <coughs> going on here and i think there's a lot more kind of research and you know testing and maybe we'll just have to wait till after the election day to find out exactly what these coalitions coalitions are and you know w- and how accurate the polling is because it's right now it is projecting a very weird situation so uh right now the i think the average of polls is Plus three in Wisconsin for Harris, plus two in Michigan for Harris, uh, plus one in North Carolina, plus or tied in Nevada, tied in Pennsylvania, tied in Georgia, and tied in Arizona. So doing better in North Carolina marginally than places like Nevada, places like Arizona that you know the Democrats comfortably won the last time, in the case of Nevada, the last two times. So a lot of very interesting stuff there to process and looking for more evidence in terms of the basis that Kamala Harris is exciting and what states they may be prevalent in is definitely going to be something we're going to continue to do here on News Flash's election coverage. The debate rhetoric of Donald Trump and J.D. Vance, uh, I guess J.D. has not had a debate, but he has still said very similar things, has caused two elementary schools to be evacuated and a middle school closed on Friday in the wake of threats in Springfield, Ohio, the Springfield City School District said. It was not immediately clear if Friday's evacuations were a new threat or linked to bomb threats sent via email Thursday morning to multiple agencies and media outlets in the city, according to the city's commission office. On Thursday, explosive detecting canines helped police clear multiple facilities in the threat, including two elementary schools, City Hall, and a few driver's license bureaus. Springfield Police Chief Allison Elliott told reporters the uh, the 
county court facilities were cleared out of an abundance of caution. Um, the and it, it has explicitly been confirmed now that the um, you know it is really you know and it's explicitly confirmed that it was related to the Haitian community here. Rob Rue. Uh, the mayor accused national Republicans who are amplifying wild rumors of a from a far right provocateur that Haitian immigrants in Springfield are hunting and eating people's pets of hurting our city. Uh, no bomb, of course, was found out of the threat was made. There was enough negative language, according to the mayor here, um, toward immigrants that Haitian folks uh, that would toward Haitian folks, uh, towards immigrants, he's saying here, that would bring enough concern. And then when it followed up with, at the end, a bomb threat, it was pretty much just the beginning of the conclusion that they're going to threaten to harm people. So, yeah, like this is this is the kind of stuff that you, and I, I said this the last time, it sets people up for a pogrom. This is just blatant dehumanization. And that's why I think it's so important to study history. And you could see, you know, the various times that these throughout history, whether it be, you know, in the lead up to the Holocaust, whether it be in the lead up to pretty much any sort of mass slaughter, you you hear these people coming in, doing all these crazy things, you know, doing these things that are just are designed to, these wild claims sort of make them designed to seem as alien and as inhuman and as unlike the quote unquote native population as much as possible. And that's what sets up the hate. That's what gets people going. Like, they're killing my pets. Like, who are these people? We got to get them out of here. They're not supposed to be like, it just sends them into a frenzy. And it's not based in truth. And it's not based on what the con- actual contributions of Haitians to the society have been for a very long time and are essentially elucidated by the fact that how many you know major people in the community have come up to defend them and how the town essentially begged immigrants to come to provide more labor to provide more you know a shot to the economy and actually make the economy better because again this this is what america is it is a constant story of assimilating various groups getting them to in some ways maintain some parts of their cultural identity but in all intents and purposes for what functionally matters become american buy into the american project and that's been very very successful um and we see that we see that with countless cases throughout american history whether it be first you know the white ethnic groups then you know tons of just assimilation on a very very massive scale and you have people like there's some the well-known videos of uh people coming over the border that are just like already just like there's too many coming in let's turn them around like it is a, a fast assimilation process in america and that's part of it is just metabolizing everything so fast that's what makes america so great and so i would say exceptional and powerful um is that particular aspect of it um trump even referenced again the conspiracy theory in tuesday night's debate in the same day jd vance mentioned the rumor on x which has been flooded with ai generated images of trump surrounded by dogs cats and ducks rue on tuesday condemned the rumors as false with zero verified reports of such disparaging claims abc's debate monitor moderator david muir made the same fact check on tuesday rue told the springfield news sun rumors like this are taking away from the real issues such as uh, uh involving our housing or school resources or our overwhelmed healthcare system. And of course, we talked about in the last show, the 11-year-old boy who was killed when a minivan driven by an immigrant from Haiti collided with a school bus, uh, essentially told that Trump uh, in advance to stop using his son's name for political gain. So all around, a very, very scary story. And a you know, as the right continues to go down this path, it continues to try and separate immigrants of all types and all kinds from you know what is acceptable, what is human so to speak in our society what is a citizen in our society um and what uh, people who are just taking them out of you know the considerations of humanity being treated with respect not being you know smeared all the time and not having people constantly threatening you wherever you go as they take away that right for you know migrants continue to try and do it throughout their you know political project it is so important that we have also people on the ostensible left, people like Kamala Harris, who are you know coming out, speaking out against that, and actually again making the argument, also beat it home, making the argument for migrants for the good they do in this country. Um, because if there's not that counter pull, then more and more people are just going to get pulled to the evil coming out of the right wing at the moment, and that would be a very very sad turn of events indeed. Strike! 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 
Strike! This is about respect. This is about addressing the past. And this is about fighting for our future. Our members rejected the contract by 94.6%. <laughs> and they voted to strike by 96%. We had discriminatory conduct, we had coercive questioning, we had unlawful surveillance, and we had unlawful promise of benefits. So Boeing has to stop breaking the law, has to bargain in good faith, and we will be back at the table whenever we can get there to drive forward on the issues that our members say are important. Congratulations, machinists. There you go. It's the Machinist Union going on strike. That was the local president talking. Tens of thousands of Boeing factory workers went on strike this morning for the first time since 2008 after rejecting a deal that included a 25 pay percent pay increase over four years and another blow to the company amid safety concerns and a growing debt burden. So, you know, I think this with this one, you know, I almost wasn't really surprised that they rejected a 25% pay rise over four years because I think the issues going on with Boeing are a little bit deeper than just pay and conditions. It's the fact that they're, you know, their company is lost all credibility in the international, you know, marketplace. And it's one of the key uh, U.S. industrial companies in terms of making bomb everything from bombs to to airplanes is a major major source of government subsidies. And essentially, represents the U.S. in the industrial world in a very very big way in, you know, in terms of defense contracting, commercial aviation. I believe they also do some kind of space stuff as well. Like they're an absolutely huge company, and they are a company that again has lost all this credibility. You know, again, the, the space stuff, the the, the Starliner, I think that they said. Um, was not able to take those people back from the International Space Station, so they're going to have to send Elon Musk's goofy ass up there to go get them in some, some SpaceX capsule because the Boeing, you know, the design process and the leadership process has been so corner-cutting and has been so dangerous that they were just unable to do it. So, again, it's not, it's not just a 25% pay rise that they're, you know, they want to probably work, if I had to guess, in a company that has credibility, in a company that can produce products that you know are not pressured into being you know subpar using non-confirming parts and just the kind of laughing stock of the industrial world there um because it, it has to be pretty pretty darn embarrassing um so the yeah, again the message was clear that the tentative agreement we reached with IM leadership was not acceptable to the members, Boeing said in a statement in reference to the almost 95% of union members, as we just heard, who rejected the union deal. The company said it was ready to go back to the negotiating table and reach a new agreement. And I think what they're going to, you know, try and want, um, you know, it's expected, it's really going to halt production to commercial airplanes. The walkout comes a month after aerospace industry veteran and engineer Kelly Ortberg took over as Boeing's chief executive. Um, supply chain issues brought on by the pandemic significantly upended companies' relationship with employees. Uh, Bloomberg Industrial Strength Newsletter wrote, unions realize that they are the ones with le lever leverage and not the companies there, again, pushing it to their advantage. Uh, that is a quote from Bloomberg there. But I think, again, you, I think you do have to look at this as kind of outside the normal labor dispute because of all of these things. Um, and they seem to be, I think, pretty amenable to it for this reason. And it would be interesting to see if they push for some sort of governmental response, some sort of regulatory response to rein in and essentially assure people that they are going to be changing and that they're going to cut out some of the really, really horrific stuff in terms of safety that they've been accused of in the past and actually be a more reputable company. Like it's a very, very, you know, it's unclear at this point, but I think it is clear the breakdown of trust has been a very big deal. Um, as well as a 25% pay rise over four years, a preliminary agreement that workers rejected included a commitment from Boeing to build the next commercial plane in the Seattle area. If the project started during the lifetime of the contract, the union had initially targeted a number of improvements to workers' packages, including a 40% pay rise. On the face of it, though, it's hard to see a quick solution unless Boeing capitulates, um, and it could cost the company and the suppliers billions. Um, 
you know, so Dave Calhoun was the previous predecessor. He announced in the spring that he would step down, and the you know the fraud charges and the criminal fine of nearly two hundred forty-four million dollars in connection with two fatal crashes of seven thirty-seven Max planes more than five years ago, and the January blowing out of the Alaska Airlines door, and the uh, cap uh, imposed on the seven thirty-seven Max production by the FAA. Also, in the you know some of the very very many problems. We didn't even mention the Space Liner one in this article. Uh, but there has been, or the Starliner one, it has been really, really rough go of that. And I would not be surprised if the union ends up walking away with some sort of, you know, assurances in terms of better quality control, in terms of better products, because, you know, it's probably, it's got to be pretty darn embarrassing uh, to work for a company that is so, so unsafe on so many levels and has really just lost the trust of so, so many people. Like in everyone I know now, you, you may not even follow the news whatsoever, but you're checking whenever you get on a flight to to see if it's Boeing or if it's Airbus. So that is definitely going to be playing a role in this company and in these uh, negotiations. There was an interesting interview I wanted to get to with the uncommitted movement leader, Abbas Alobia, um, about the Harris campaign, what it's like working with it, the DNC and all that. And they're essentially, you know, they have two more days but they are trying to arrange a meeting with Kamala Harris for September 15th. We have followed up on our longstanding quest to meet with the vice president and senior members of her team to discuss policy asks. We've also included in our follow-up specific quest for her to meet with Palestinian Americans who have family in Gaza. So far, we have not heard much of anything. And like I think that is a quote from um, Alawiya, um, the uncommitment uncommitted movements to focus on Harris makes sense as interviewer Alex press, but what is the assessment and thinking about the current situation with president Biden? The pressure needs to be both on Biden and Harris to change the policy now. Um, so our focus is to continuing uh, on continuing to keep the pressure for both. And again, the question is how, like just politely asking for meetings is not going to be effective. And I think that what we see here from this interview is just, you know, as someone who is definitely kind of on the more moderate in terms of Palestinian activist groups, we don't see any plan or any acknowledgement that this has been a fundamentally un- unsuccessful strategy. And there's no plan or no prospect of a plan, uh, you know, to quote Donald Trump of, this working like it is not going to be pressuring anyone it's not going to be convincing anyone um she uh alex press asked abbas alawiya about the kind of differences between various you know pro-palestinian groups there's a small faction with the democratic party that has outsized influence due to profit uh interests of weapons manufacturers and other factors they don't want us inside the united center they don't want us walking around the halls of congress um, at the DNC, we got inquiries from folks, some of the well intentions, saying, don't you think that the protesters outside undermine what you're trying to do to get a seat at the table? But we're not trying to do with a seat at the table is push for another bomb. The thing that's preventing not another bomb is the Democratic Party's leadership offensive. Uh, as leadership's offensive and continued support for sending weapons and killing civilians. We need to be disciplined as people who support this policy, urgent policy demand uh, to not fall into traps of attacking different tactics, but to be clear about who is sustaining this policy and making sure they feel maximum pressure. Uh, who is it that is sustaining this policy and making sure they feel maximum pressure as long as they continue to support this horrendous policy? And, like, you are, I, I, to a certain extent, I agree with that. You know, it, it's obviously the common debate about divi- divisive kind of left wing protest movements, but I think you need to have some sort of accountability, some sort of just reevaluation of the strategy, and say this is not working. We could be, we could maybe be doing better than this, and I want to really try, essentially. Just making the case that, you know, clearly Kamala Harris is not listening to us. What is your plan to get Kamala Harris to listen to us? And, you know, why hasn't it worked so far? It's not even, again, there, there is a tone. It, it goes a two-way street. Like, there's a tone of people kind of from the more outside looking in. They're saying, oh, these people are sellouts. They just want, you know, a seat at the table. They want, a, you know, a fancy career, which is not true by, you know, in some accounts. But I think... You also, if you're kind of the person who is pushing for that seat at the table strategy, you have to be amenable and you have to be understanding of the fact that people aren't going to be thrilled if you don't produce any results. And that's very similar to, I think, what's going on with the AOC situation going on right now. 
and just the general very very common 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 uh cycle in left-wing politics of just people just getting mad at each other for not getting anything done and then all involving into a circle circular firing squad um but it would be nice to hear him kind of you know reflect on this as we look at the interview you know how are you building your coalition she asked uh Aloia, what is your plan for moving forward it's our assessment that our anti-war movement is at a strongest when we recognize what power we do have within the po- a party and what power we don't um part of the analysis in the moment on the uncommitted side of things is recognizing that those of us in our country who are against this war do not have enough political power in this moment to stop the genocide there's a very difficult thing to sit with but it means that part of our analysis too is that no one demographic alone will create political conditions necessary to change this policy what's going to be required is that the party leadership realizing that across our democratic party coalition whether we're talking about unions or youth-led organizations or black-led organizations or jewish-led organizations blah blah blah, blah folks are waking up to the reality and continuing to build on, in many cases, long-standing leadership around the issue. Folks are increasingly aware that the issue of Palestinian human rights is something that is not is very important to a whole lot of Democratic voters, not just a few Arabs in Dearborn, which is more than the conservative elements within the Democratic Party coalition would like for the Democratic Party leadership to believe. And I I have to say, like, I don't think he's made that case. I don't think he's made that case convincingly enough. And maybe because the case, you know, post Joe Biden switching out for Kamala Harris, you know, the case can't be made. But, you know, uncommitted showed that, I think, with the with the votes um, back in the primary situation. But now it's a different candidate. Now the 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 uncommitted votes in Michigan earlier this year could not be further away. They feel like 10 years ago. So. What is he going to do to show the importance of this and how, you know, I think the time, the, the time calls for, you know, some sort of, some sort of way to show that this is not going to be tolerated, whether it be, you know, strategically voting third party, whether it be trying to, you know, so making some sort of broader political organization, whether it be some sort of, you know, some sort of, I'm, I'm no expert on this, but I think it's, it, it needs to, this, the question start or need to start being asked, like, why isn't this working? How can we make a change to be more effective as quickly as possible? Because, again, this stuff is just not working. And, you know, how are, essentially, how are we going to make progress into that? Like he says, I think he brings up a good point there, that they do start listening to us. And they do see the relevance of this you know, if maybe the polls start going bad in a few key states and you know, it seems to be a real issue, then she'll she'll change it. But she has to see that it's in her political interest enough so that she breaks the poll of the Israel lobby, um, which is going to be a very, very tough thing to do. Wanted to end today on this piece from Dropside News. Anas al-Sharif has become one of the most recognizable faces on television in the Arab world. For the past 27 months, the 20 or sorry, 11 months, the 27 year old Al Jazeera correspondent has been reporting from the front lines of Israel's genocidal assault on Gaza, now the deadliest place for journalists in modern history. By some counts, over 160 journalists have been killed in Gaza since October, a rate of one journalist killed every other day for nearly a year. Al Sharif has personally endured threats against his life, and his home was targeted in an Israeli attack, killing his father. Al Sharif is just one of the few reporters who have remained in northern Gaza since October 7th, an area from which, just a few days into the war, the Israeli government ordered 1.1 million people to evacuate. One journalist told Dropside News that there are only about 30 working journalists left in northern Gaza today because so many have been killed or displaced. Like so many Palestinians in Gaza, Al Sharif has been forced to endure the unimaginable. In November, he reported receiving multiple calls from the Israeli army officers ordering to him to cease coverage and to leave northern Gaza. He also said he received WhatsApp messages um, disclosing his location and voice notes. In his report, he ends by saying, I'm one of the few journalists in north in the north covering what's happening despite the threats i'm not leaving the field and i will continue reporting in northern gaza less than three weeks after he was killed by the israeli army his family home family home in the jabalia refugee camp was bombed his father was killed by the israeli army i think is what it's saying um jamal al-sharif 
Al Sharif, who was, by the way, uh, the father was nine years old. Al Sharif had been doing nonstop coverage and had not been in his home in 60 days. The committee to project journalist said of his father's killing at the time. CPJ is deeply uh, troubled or alarmed by the pattern of journalists in Gaza reporting and receiving threats and subsequently that their family members have been killed. Um, Sharif was again threatened just last month when he broadcast carnage of an August 10th Israeli strike on a school of Gaza City where thousands of displaced Palestinians were seeking shelter, killing over 100 people. I can't describe what's happening. Uh, this is with the Tabayin school that we talked about um, at the time in a very big massacre, and he got punished for that as well with more threats specifically from the Israeli government as he was on the scene right when that was happening, when they hit the, the school right before the, the dawn prayer. In response to another Al Jazeera journalist lauding Al Sharif's brave coverage, the Israeli military put out a statement targeting his work. He's covering up the crimes of Hamas and Islamic Jihad by taking shelter inside schools. I'm convinced that he knows the names of a great number of Hamas terrorists among those killed in the school. Um, uh, said the Arabic language spokesperson for the IDF, Abakai are uttery responding on X, but he presents a lie, the motivation for which has nothing to do with the residents of Gaza. The comments prompted Al Jazeera to condemn what it called Israel's blatant act of intimidation and incitement, saying that they were deeply concerned for the safety of Al Sharif. There has been relative silence among Western journalists and media outlets in the face of Palestinian journalists being killed in record numbers. In some cases, Israel openly admitted to killing journalists and accused them of being part of Hamas. No more devastating, I think, really for that was the death of Ismail al Ghul, who was killed in the really tragic uh, strike, Israeli drone strike in Gaza City in his car. Really gruesome videos of that. Um, al Ghul was decapitated in the strike. In an act of protest, journalists in Gaza threw their press flak jackets to the ground. Al Sharif addressed the crowd, holding up al Ghul's mangled flak jacket, saying, This press vest is the vest that global and local institutions preach about. This vest did not protect our colleague Ismail. It did not protect any of my colleagues. As you as you can see, look at the vest, stained with blood in the flesh of Ismael. What did he do? What did he do? Broadcast the image, broadcast the suffering of the people? Sorry, Ismael, we'll continue sharing the message after you, he said. This is the note he left, dropside news from Gaza. And we'll end with that today. Our coverage as journalists during this war in Gaza has been a different kind of coverage completely. We have faced extreme difficulties. We face threats. We have been disconnected from the outside world complete by completely by the cutting off of internet and phone signals. We are living through tragic and difficult circumstances as journalists, and we are facing difficulties in sending messages and sending reports and sending any material in general. Of course, the Palestinian journalist is living painful and harsh conditions like the rest of his people between displacement and bombing and destruction. So many of our journalist colleagues have lost their families, lost their family members, uh, family members, lost their relatives, lost their friends and loved ones. This puts a lot of pressure on journalists during the war, especially because the Israeli occupation does not distinguish between journalists, children, doctors, nurses. Everyone is being targeted continuously and constantly. Especially in the north of Gaza, my colleagues and I were totally cut off from the outside world from the beginning of the war. This created a huge liability, a huge problem for us. It would be difficult to send any reports or content. We'd have to go to very dangerous areas. For the sake of continuing our coverage and sending images and stories, we'd have to go to tall buildings in order to find an internet signal or a phone signal through electronic sims and thereby send the reports or content or the scenes that we documented with the lowest quality in order to be broadcast to the world and show the world what is happening here in the Gaza Strip. That's just one of the difficulties that we encountered. Personally, I was threatened by the Israeli occupation and told that I need to stop reporting from the north and go to the south. But I refused the order and didn't stop my coverage for one moment despite the threats, despite the bombing, despite the siege. Because I didn't stop and because of my continuous coverage, the Israeli occupation targeted my home and the home of my family that led to my father being martyred. May God have mercy on him. The circumstances were cruel and difficult and painful for me, painful for all of us, but this has only made me more determined to continue reporting. Every journalist in Gaza has suffered these circumstances. In the midst of our reporting, we face great difficulties through the targeting in the areas that we're in, targeting close to us. We slept in hospitals, shelters, slept in the streets, on highways, we slept inside vehicles and cars. We were displaced more than 20 times from one place to another, from one area to another. Our situation was the same as the rest of our people. We faced great difficulties. Of course, the situation in the north was especially difficult for journalists because there was no materials available, no press supplies available. We had to make do with limited capabilities with our simple phones and in order to report the story, send the image, and report on the crimes of the Israeli occupation. 
What I'm talking about is just a small part of what we can record, what we can say, what we can document. And the suffering is much greater. The suffering is difficult and tragic for us and all our people. Despite the suffering, we are committed, all of us as journalists, to continue this path and continue reporting. And this made us continue up to this moment. And yet, despite all the difficulties and tragic circumstances, all of us are reporting every day and every hour. We have a duty to continue to report. This is what makes us continue. That is that this is our cause. It is the duty of the world to see and witness what we are documenting and what we are reporting, to bear witness. Maybe the world won't act, maybe the world won't help us, but there might be a motive to stop the war. Every time I document a massacre or event bombing, I think that maybe through this bombing or this image, the war could stop and the war could end. This drives us to continue the coverage until our last breath. Of course, as I mentioned, the Israeli occupation was deliberately targeting journalists in a continuous way, and we're now talking about close to 180 journalists that have been targeted in Gaza. It is clear that the Israeli occupation does not want the picture to get out, does not want the word to get out. It does not want us to document crimes it is committing to our people, as what happened to our dear friend and colleague, the Al Jazeera correspondent Ismail Ghul, after he was assassinated by the Israeli occupation, as he was documenting what was happening in the crimes of the Israeli occupation. So the Israeli occupation targeted him in a direct way that Ismail could not continue his coverage. But what the occupation does not know is that is after Ismail was martyred, we, his journalist colleagues, are more determined to continue Ismail's past and convey his message, despite the circumstances and the death threat. Um, and despite the danger of the situation. We could be targeted and bombed at any moment, but our situation is the same as all of our people, as the men, women, and children who are being murdered every moment in Gaza. And we will end it right there and return to you on Monday as Spin News Flash.